Hey, what's up? I'm Jay, and in this video, I'm going to talk a bit about how I made myself in 3D. So one of my latest projects was, uh, you know, kind of a 3D portrait scene image illustration that included myself, among some other things, in 3D. So you guys seem to like that project and video. I got some questions and, uh, you know, it got a thousand likes, which on my channel is good. So I thought, hey, let's make uh, a more in-depth video and give you guys some nuggets, you know, that you can use in your own work or if you're just curious. So let's talk about that right now. So first off, the overall goal or idea with the project is something that I wanted to kind of squeeze in uh, amongst bigger projects. I just got the urge. You know, I mentioned in the video that it's just I had some swirling thoughts and emotions. And, you know, for those that don't know uh, what I was talking about or what exactly was going on, but still still to this day. But at that time when I made it was when, you know, some 3D artists were making life changing money um, with NFTs. And it's something that even today I don't I mean, I understand blockchain and stuff like that, but definitely like why some art sells and why some doesn't is an elusive uh, thing. And yeah, so I was just seeing artists that do, you know, not exactly what I do, but uh, different artists that I follow that were, you know, making crazy money all of a sudden. And it was something that you never thought was possible and here was happening. And there was a lot of, you know, people getting into certain platforms and, couldn't get into other platforms and social media and influence and popularity had, you know, all played a role. So anyways, I couldn't help myself, but think of some of these things, uh, while I was trying to continue to just grind and work on my craft anyway. So I didn't know what to do with this pent up energy that I had, uh, at that time. And I thought I would pour it into a project and that's what this project was. Initially, I thought I'm just going to li limit it to a week uh, and the idea was like myself focusing on doing work surrounded by, you know, all the things like representations of, of thoughts and feelings I had going on in my head. That was the idea. And so I set off to do that. Uh, all in all, the project took about two weeks, uh, probably, um, which is still pretty fast for me, honestly. And I think actually limiting myself or, you know, setting a goal for a week and going over actually still made it a relatively short timeline. Also, the project got a little bit bigger than I initially thought, but overall I was happy with it. So before I get more into the details of this project, this video is sponsored by Skillshare. I'm gonna talk more about that towards the end of the video, but if you want a free trial of Skillshare, you can click the link in the description below. So starting off, I started with my base mesh, which I, I am working on a version of that to release to the public. I do get questions about that. So if you're in the market for base meshes, mine will be available soon. Something else I did in this project is I purchased this 3D chair, which I have not done before. I haven't purchased a model really before. But, you know, speaking of NFTs, it was really Beeple who made me want to even consider that because it was one of the apprehensions I had to make this image. You know, I thought making a Cintiq uh, in ZBrush, doing that hard service modeling would be good practice. And I was confident I could make everything else about it. But modeling the chair just seems so tedious. You know, I needed a chair and it just felt like a barrier. So I just went on to Turbo Squid and I saw how much are chairs and it was like $5. And I was like, yep. So I just bought this chair and put it in the scene and never thought about it. It's something that I might do in more images, just buy, you know, a model that's not really the focus to create a larger scene. You know, it's something that would prevent me from even doing the scene to begin with. So you'll see, I'll probably talk a little bit about this more in the end too, but self-portraits are difficult. They're a challenge for many reasons. Likeness is hard. And then being critical of yourself and looking at images of yourself is strange and kind of, kind of bizarre. But I feel the key to a good self-portrait, at least one as an artist that I feel content about, is to be genuine with the idea you know, it's this. So what I'm doing is I'm not doing a raw likeness of myself. What I'm doing is trying to incorporate myself into an illustration. As a part of that, I've covered my mouth with tape. The idea is that I'm, I have tape around my mouth and my headphones to just lock in and like just listen to, I'm just listening to music. I'm working. I'm not saying anything. That's the idea. I'm just focusing. So because of that, because I have my mouth covered, it actually makes likeness easier. And something else I thought was I'm just not going to get the camera that close to myself and that main illustration, I don't. So 
it's uh it's not that crucial that the likeness is on point so that gave me kind of confidence that i could make this image uh and just power through so you see i do a lot of hard surface modeling in here with the cintiq and then i'll make the headphones right now you see me slicing poly groups on the main cintiq body which i started with z modeler but now i'm using i'm like slicing these up and then running a z remesh to get these clean planes that i can now use nano mesh to uh, make all these spheres which i'll then cut out so kind of a combination of all different kinds of zbrush modeling things here it's a lot of z modeler and i'm using the sub d preview and i'm using booleans so that's kind of the main workflow uh, for me anyway, I think that's the main workflow for hard surface modeling if you're not going to sculpt it and you know I needed this to be Clean looking there's going to be light reflecting off of it and everything But I did only have to make the backside But you know I had to make the stand and eventually the headphones So I think the stand was probably the most difficult part to make the Cintiq I just you know I just use some reference. It's it's symmetrical everything's symmetrical. So that always helps uh, but yeah, just lots of Z modeler and uh, and then extruding and and checking it with sub D preview. And uh, yeah, it took, I guess it took a bit, but again, it was good hard surface modeling practice for myself. I want to get a little better at that and incorporate more hard surface into the work that I do. For the headphones, I just started with a, a sphere, squished it down, and then uh, did some extruding, made a poly group to extrude the label kind of block shape. Um, you know, so it's kind of similar stuff. Just take some planning. Uh, I just sculpted the little you know pad there these are actually my favorite headphones they're not the ones i'm wearing right now they're at they're at work i actually own two of these headphones uh so i thought you know i'd want to do my favorite headphones in the image for the band uh, the idea i had was i'll just draw i'll just paint a mask on a cylinder make that a poly group then use smooth groups to make a really clean poly group and then i can z re z remesh that and i'll get a really nice geo on this kind of complicated shape that i could push and pull and that worked out great. Then I could just extrude that. It'll be nice and clean. And uh, and that's how I finished the headphones, just extruding and, again, sub -D preview. So nothing is, like, subdivided and baked in yet. And then I can convert it and then just blur the edge a little bit. And that's it. So likeness. Uh, likeness is something I generally try to avoid in my work for enjoyment just because it can be tedious and time-consuming. But when it comes to self-portraits... It's a, uh, it, there's a unique aspect in that you have access to the best reference and you have your own unique insight into whether or not it resembles, you know, yourself generally, whether it be in the form of a mirror or in my case, I have a camera set up. I took some footage of my, you know, head turning around at different angles. So I think this is why we see self portraits so commonly throughout our history is that, you know, you have access to the model and the reference right there all the time. So I definitely took advantage of that and I took some reference pictures. You know, I did do some different angles. You know, I, I know not only do you require a front view and a side view, but I could tilt my head down, which was part of what the composition was gonna be. And I could look up, you know, those angles are hard to find online. And when you're making someone in 3D, those angles can be hugely insightful. So I took it upon myself to just eyeball it. Again, I didn't think I was going to move that close camera wise and it just needed to generally look like myself. But I think if you're someone that's learning likeness, go ahead and load it up into ZBrush using Spotlight or make ZBrush transparent and trace it. Especially when you're starting out. If you're really trying to nail a likeness, it's all about accuracy. So you should be using every tool you have available to you. Uh, and if you're practicing using your eye, then that's what you would do. It's really up to where you are as an artist and what you're working on, but never feel opposed to just straight up tracing reference because, you know, that's kind of what likeness is all about. It's less artistic in a way, and it's more technical, and accuracy plays a huge role in achieving it. So this project was about speed. I still utilized my skin details kit to like add the skin detail, but when it comes to the skin detailing and even the texture painting later on, it's, I'm not doing the same workflow that I always do. I'm doing like a much speedier version of that, a less precious version. And I'm happy that I ended up pushing the camera in close and it still held up. So it gives me a little bit more wiggle room on future projects because for instance, in this one, 
I did not use HD geometry. I just subdivided, you know, the head mesh high enough to get some detail. So is it the same resolution as some of my other work? No. But does that really matter in the end? Not really. And not, not in this particular image. And it really speeds things up to not use HD geometry because you can work on the whole head at once. You can tile the pores, which is what I did all at once. And then you can just bake it out and, uh, and you're good to go. So that sped up the workflow and I'm happy with how that came out. I actually made the hair using my fiber mesh presets too. I have a, you know, like a guides preset in there that I used. I edited maybe a little bit just so everything was fat and I could work with it, you know, and it worked on this particular head mesh. But uh, I was happy how this came out. This is the smoothest workflow here. It's something that I might make a video about later. This workflow is something, you know, I learned at a ZBrush Summit, the idea of it. And it's, I like the idea of manipulating curves, like starting the guide curves in ZBrush and then going to Maya with it. So you can like transfer the curves over and you turn them into the guide curves for your X-Gen groom. And, uh, and I really didn't have to do much editing. Again, it gave me confidence knowing that I wasn't gonna get too close, but ultimately it held up so well that I could. And then I, I imported uh, X-Gen preset that I've saved. I started saving all my X-Gen presets to just you know hit the ground running. So I actually just used my Steve Jobs preset to start with. And, uh, and that really made me, that this is the quickest hairstyle that I've made so far. And I'm happy with how it turned out. The tape itself on my mouth is just uh, all hand sculpted. I uh, started with a simple piece of geometry and stretched it around and then just push and pull and did normal sculpting. And then to get that little kind of duct tape pattern, I used a grid in the um, surface noise settings. And that was it. I could just put a metallic shader on it and call it a day. So I thought I was going to do some fancy shader texture work, but really I just made the model and, and that was that. So also keep things fast. I knew I was going to do a lot of procedural texturing. I wasn't going to do any like substance painter stuff. And, uh, and I wasn't going to do again, not get too close up a lot of procedural stuff. So I actually decimated, uh, the Cintiq, for instance, the headphones, um, the table a little bit. And then the other meshes like my sweatpants and my sweatshirt, you know, I'm making myself, it's just very accurate to quarantine. That was the idea with, uh, you know, it was supposed to be like me working as I am today. And uh, like, I'm wearing a sweatshirt and sweatpants right now, dude. So it's like so accurate. So yeah, I actually just did like medium resolution versions of those models uh, in case I wanted to, you know, have any tiling stuff because it's impossible to UV map decimated geo but the hard surface stuff it's just decimated so then when i got everything the resolution i want i knew i was going to export so i got everything the resolution i wanted decimated everything else then i just i named it i have to name every subtool so you can make sense of this and then i just exported the whole scene as a single fbx so i imported that into maya and then i just started building a scene around that and then i just spent the rest of the time in maya other than any kind of head updates but that was it for the the modeling the eyebrows and the eyelashes I did do in Maya. I just placed those curves. I made new descriptions and, you know, I just did that the old fashioned way. While I was lighting the scene, I got the idea to incorporate the Cintiq. I thought it would be cool if the Cintiq itself was helping light the scene. And so uh, as a kind of little Easter egg or, uh, you know, fun idea, I just went to my own YouTube and I pulled a, a screenshot of myself working in Maya to put on the light as an image light that I was illuminating, you know, get a, you get a little bit of um, different kind of reflections in the eyeballs and the glasses that way, and some different colors in the scene. So that's what I used for the screen light. The rest of the scene was going to be surrounded with these icons and images that represent, you know, these thoughts and different, you know, websites and software and just stuff that that's in my head and in my life, right? So. What I did first was I created a big image with the different logos, you know, everything I could think of and put it on one big atlas, like image that I knew I could just map everything to. So then I imported that as a guide, started making these simple shapes, cylinders and cubes with rounded, nice edges, kind of wanted to look like candy, like pretty, you know, plasticky model signs or something like that. Then I could project them. Uh, move the images, like move the UVs around the certain 
um, images that represented those shapes. And that's how I created all these logos. The texturing I knew was going to be procedural. So I used this project to use a script or, you know, plugin for Maya that I've been wanting to use that I picked up called Shade It from uh, Wizix, who makes these great scripts for Maya and Arnold. Again, making it fast, high quality. That's the idea. Get better at that. Uh, the script was cool. A little bit of bugginess sometimes, but ultimately I'm happy with the results. So uh, yeah, so it's a thumbs up for me. I liked it. So when I had all these uh, geometries, you know, built, I knew like one of the ideas when I started this project was I was going to make all these and just, I want them to just rain down, you know, and use physics to populate the scene and create all these interactions that I thought, again, would be faster than hand placing them and look more believable. So I used MASH inside of Maya, comes with Maya. And first I used MASH to, to distribute the models, spread them out, make a bunch of copies. And then I used them to actually do the simulation. So this took, you know, a few attempts uh, for me to dial it in. And, you know, I haven't done it before. And, uh, you know, some of the, res the results weren't exactly what I was looking for. So I made different kind of collision geometries and everything to help guide, you know, what would happen. And then I had to make sure the scene had enough frames so that it could simulate for a long enough period of time. Uh, and yeah, it ended up fairly well. Uh, after the final sim, I did do quite a bit of adjusting by hand, deleting the things that were in the way, just making it look good to camera. And then, you know, switching out anything that was like noticeably a duplicate. Uh, I actually just would move UVs too, because I could keep the object. So if it was a cylinder, then I would just move the UVs to another icon that wasn't visible in the scene just so, just so I had a all the variety from the camera but all in all I was pretty happy with what happened I think uh you know I got some happy accidents and I thought it, it, it got me going quickly but I did ultimately do quite a bit by hand also using that shade it script uh really worked out well too I'm happy with that I'll I'm gonna try to use that in some future things like with metal and paint different materials but I just used their plastic preset which got me set up with things like subsurface scattering and translucency. And what I did was I just dug around in the node graph that it made and found where to plug my atlas map of the icon. So things like roughness and subsurface, things like that were all procedural. I got all that stuff essentially for free. Like the, there's like a bump map with some scratches. And then I just had this simple color map. So I'm really pleased with how that turned out too. So I needed to model my glasses too. That's something I didn't really, you know, think about early on. Um, so I just knocked that out really quick. I just took some images with my phone of my glasses on my desk. I imported those images into Maya and I just quickly like poly modeled it using sub D modeling to just knock those out really quick. I was still struggling with the scenes composition, uh, you know, kind of all the way up to the end, just making it interesting as an image while staying true to that initial idea and the scene that I had built up to that time, I didn't want to make a big radical change, but it was hard to incorporate all the different ideas in a way that still made a pleasing illustration. So for me, the key was finally using some atmosphere in the scene, which created depth and made a really like magical interaction with the light. I even thought about calling the image focus from the beginning because that was, that's what it was about for me was focusing and uh, not being distracted. And uh, I thought we could, you know, focusing the light made a lot of sense in the image and the name and the composition. And that light mixing with the atmosphere just created a really cool interaction. And it also made, there's so much space in the scene that isn't the subject at the table that the atmosphere, I think, along with all those reflections, gave it interest that wasn't there. So I did that by adding an AI atmosphere node in the environment input in the Arnold render settings. And then I was just continually adjusting the density, the color and the attenuation until I was happy with the overall effect. And then the real magic is when it starts mixing with a light. And to get that focused beam look that I was after, I actually ended up using photometric lights, which I don't use too often. But what photometric lights do is they allow you to use IES profiles, which are these like text files. You can get them online and they're meant to simulate different kinds of uh, shapes that a physical light would have. And so I was playing around with different photometric IES profiles. You can actually download a bunch from the Arnold 
uh, documentation. That's probably where I got these. So I tried, I tried a few until I got one that really felt like that beam look I was after. And then the other thing I did was I added a, a decay to the light so that it could have a very high exposure and be hot towards the top of the image and then, you know, gradient down so that it's still dark towards the bottom and nothing's blown out. But there's really like this focused beam in the center of the image. For the skin texturing, I just poly painted that in ZBrush. I just did my normal thing with some variation, uh, different scatter brushes and stuff, getting a, you know, trying to get a good color variety and uh, making sure it's high enough to get small, um, you know, patterns as, as well as big patterns. But the small crispy stuff really helps uh, in making skin feel believable to have those details in the base color. I even used the cavity masking to try and like paint darker stuff on my nose and stuff to look like black heads and little details like that. I exported that base color map from the multi-map exporter, uh, you know, in ZBrush and added it as my subsurface color in Arnold. I actually just stole a roughness map from another character. I think it was probably the cyberpunk girl. The UVs weren't even identical, but it, it didn't matter. Uh, so that's how loosey goosey I was and how it really didn't matter. For the spec, I just did some noise and, uh, and then I did, I added an AI noise to the displacement, which I'm always doing to mix the skin detail. So I dialed it in. So it's very small, just to, that micro detail that helps skin feel realistic. And that was pretty much the shader setup. So fairly simple. So as I said at the beginning, while I was working on this, I was, you know, I was moving the camera in closer to make sure things were okay. But I thought it was holding up, you know, better and better as I was close. So I started to work on it. Uh, it was kind of a stretch goal, which again, made it give me a safety net. You know, I, I knew my illustration was in pretty good shape now. And then I was just doing these alternate angles where I was closer to camera. So it gave me some, some reason to do like the stubble, which goes along with my quarantine sweatpants uniform, you know, to make it very accurate to life that I just haven't shaved in a week. And I thought it would make, you know, a better image. I had to mask out the beard hairs where the tape was. Uh, so that it looks like, you know, it's not poking through and stuff, but yeah, some quick, quick hair work, not the best, but it's okay. Uh, I adjusted the hair around the headphones to look a little bit better, uh, close up the hairline to look a little bit clo uh, better close up. I added the cord on the headphones, which I think, I think all these things even help the illustration point of view too, by the way, but I don't think it would have been worth it if that was the only thing. But now that I was doing these alternate closer shots, it felt like, you know, I had to do a little bit more to make sure it held up. So I finished these images in Photoshop. I used the camera raw filter, uh, which lets me do all kinds of stuff, including, so I'm doing some contrast adjustments a little bit, maybe some temperature adjustments, and then I'm always boosting the texture and the clarity a little bit. You can go, you know, either way, you know, you can, depends on what you're doing, but you can go pretty strong with these, but I love the camera raw filter in Photoshop. I use it on, you know, any image that I run through there, not only because these tools are great. Uh, I think they do lend themselves to making things look more photographic because it's made to be used on photos and you can save out these presets. So if you're doing a batch of images, uh, or if you wanted to update your render, you know, whatever it is super easy to just save a preset and you can load it on your next one. So the final images that I rendered out and then I applied these settings to were rendered with the atmosphere on, which adds render time and depth of field on. I did some tests in Photoshop to try and get some depth of field in post to save time and it just wasn't working. So these images took a long time to render. The illustration view and those portraits each were like six hours, something like that each. Uh, and again, that's because atmosphere adds a lot of time the light going through that atmosphere, depth of field, making that smooth takes a lot of time. So I let those render overnight, took multiple nights, obviously, and part of the day. Yeah, then I had my final image. So I often get asked about how I do or why I do my lighting a certain way or camera angles and settings. Um, sometimes, you know, I get the comment that my work will look photographic and that's not a coincidence. Um, photography, whether it be cinematography or portrait photography is my main reference and inspiration, you know, you might say. So it's something I study 
all the time just because I'm interested in it. And uh, when I make work, I think in those terms. So that's something I really like about uh, this video sponsor, Skillshare, is that they have classes on a variety of subjects, including photography. So like this particular course, Portrait Photography by Jessica Kobesi, she talks about the things that she thinks about when she's making her striking portraits and all those like insights and ideas are things that I can also be thinking about and will apply to some of my 3D images to make them feel more photographic. It's something I tell students a lot that if you take away the software and the technical things you have to learn, you know, you still have the whole art of photography where, where you place cameras, uh, what kind of lenses on the camera, where the light is, uh, how you move the lights around and the whole image, the drama that you're making, those skills are the same skills. We're just using different tools. So it's always beneficial to learn different forms of image making and photography if you do similar work to what I do. So Skillshare has a ton of educational content, all kinds of different subject matter. If you're into whatever, uh, you know, you can learn more about it and it's only $10 a month. So if you're not a member yet, the first thousand people that click that link below in my description will get a free trial of Skillshare Premium. So that is how I made myself in 3D using ZBrush, Maya, and Arnold. And I hope you learned something. I hope you found this video entertaining in some way or you learned a thing or two. Uh, I want to make some more tutorial kind of videos along with these art projects. So I've got a couple ideas of some stuff that I think you guys are going to like. If you have an idea, for a tutorial video, or if there's something you'd like to learn more about from me, let me know in the comments below and we'll see if that'll make its way into an upcoming video. All right, so that is it for this video. Thank you uh, for watching up to this point. I got some other things lined up, some ideas. Uh, definitely gonna do one of these bigger breakdown videos for the orc I just published. There's so much in there that we could probably talk about. Uh, we could probably make multiple videos about some of those subjects. So we're just going to keep it going. Uh, thank you again for watching up to this point. And until next time, peace out.